We're going to talk a little bit about the idea of collinearity and we'll also talk about what multicollinearity is and the slight difference between collinearity versus multicollinearity. So the first thing I want to point out is that the idea of collinearity it's very similar to um, the concept of confounding except that here x1 and x2 are so highly associated that their effects cannot really be separated. Um, and let me quickly point out the shorthand I'm going to use. I'm going to write C-O-L-L-T-Y okay, for collinearity. Okay. So this usually happens when the two variables, so collinearity talks about association between two variables, when their um, association is so high or essentially they might be alternate measures of the same thing. Okay, so they're capturing the same information. So the kind of classic diagram looks like this, right? very much like confounding, except what I've tried to do is draw a really big thick arrow here, trying to indicate that the association between x1 and x2 is really high, and so high that they cannot be separated. First I'm going to write the criteria for it. Again, it's almost the exact same as what it is for confounding. Um, so write the criteria, and we'll talk about some um, examples and some more ideas around this. So the criteria And the first, as always, makes sense conceptually. So our um, understanding or belief about the association, this diagram makes sense conceptually based on what we know or what we believe we know. X2 has some effect over the outcome. And so X2 um, influences the outcome. X2 and X1 are highly associated. And again, but X2 is not on the pathway between X1 and the oak. Right, so it's not um, acting as a mediator. So X1 leads to X2, which then leads to the outcome. And what we're going to see happen numerically is similar but a little bit different than uh, what we'd see for a confounder. So when we adjust or include x2 in the model, b1, like the coefficient of interest, it may or may not change. It might change, it might not change, but what the real numeric indicator is, is that but the standard error for B1 is going to increase a lot. Okay, and again, I want to keep the word lot subjective, so we don't want to have a magic rule of standard error, you know, increasing by 20% is a lot, but 19% is not a lot. All right, so we don't want to get stuck on these uh, magic thresholds just like with p-value, right? We don't want 5% to be the magic number. But I'd say if you're looking for a guide, 20 to 25% increase is a, um, what I think, a, a fair guide to use for what's a, a big change. But conceptually, does it make sense as being an alternate measure or so highly associated? That is what I think uh, is going to be a more important way to think about it, not just getting stuck on the exact numeric change. So <clears throat> what I want to say is that the idea of collinearity, it's a problem whether we're looking at effect size models or predictive models. Right, so in an effect size model, it's the biggest problem if x1 and x2 are so highly associated we can't separate them. So in the data set we've been, we've been working with, if the variable smoking and there's another variable x2, that's almost the same as recording whether or not someone smokes. Um, I can't think of a good example 
of what um, would fit there. But so if it's another measure of x1, right, an alternate measure of that, we're going to want to exclude it from the model. Um, if it's another potential variable to adjust for, so let's think of there, we were looking at the effect of smoking. Uh, maybe I shouldn't write it because it's not going to fit into this diagram. But what I wanted to say was we saw that if we want to know the effect that smoking has on FEV, we said we're going to want to adjust for H. We've explored this, we've identified that H is a confounder, and we're going to want to adjust the smoking effect for H. Now suppose we had another variable, X3, that was the grade of the student. Right, so remember, these are all kids who are um, three years old up to 19 years old. So most of them would be in grade school. Um, I don't remember the exact cutoffs. Might not be in grade school until four or possibly five. And you might get out of there a year or two before uh, 19. But what I want to say here is if we want to adjust the smoke effect for age, and we also have this other potential variable grade, right? the age of a student and the grade they're in are going to be highly associated. Right? They're not going to contain the exact info. There might be some students who have skipped a grade ahead, or some who have skipped behind, or um, school age at least here, right? the school year runs from September till about June or so. So people's age changes within a grade. Right? In a grade, they start a certain age, then the new year hits, and then they eventually become an age older. So they're not the exact same info, but age and grade are so highly correlated that they're essentially collinear, and we're going to want to only adjust for one of those two. Okay. So just to recap some of that, if there's another variable of x2 that's highly associated with x1, our variable of interest, right? if it's collinear with that, we definitely want to exclude it. If there's some potential confounders, say age and the grade of a student, and those variables are essentially alternate measures of each other, we're going to want to adjust for only one of them, not both of them. The one we choose to adjust for, um, that's sort of up to us to make that decision. We might prefer to adjust for the more recognizable variable. Right? If I tell you kids in grade six, you probably don't know what age they are. They are unless you have kids, and your kids are close to that age where you can do some of the quick mental math. So you might choose to adjust for age rather than grade, or you might have an argument for adjusting for grade instead of age, but the point is you choose one of the two, not both of them. So let me just make a note of that. We're going to want to exclude them. So whether it's a, a variable that's collinear with x1, we're going to want to exclude it. If there's two potential confounders that are highly associated with each other, we're going to exclude one of those two. If we're building a predictive model, so our goal is just to predict the outcome, and we have a bunch of x variables, x1, x2, x3, x4, and so on. Again, if there's two variables that are highly associated, alternate measures of each other, we're going to want to remove one of those from the model. And having them both in there can give us um, unstable predictions. Our model is not going to give reliable predictions on new sets of data. I want to point out a few areas for reading, optional reading. So if you want to explore a little bit more, um, there are other ways of identifying um, collinearity. There's variance inflation factors. You can read a bit about that. But essentially what that's looking at is this idea we talked about here. When you put two variables that are highly associated, what happens is the standard errors shoot up, okay, or they inflate a lot. Well, I'll give you a um, sort of artificial example in a moment to show you why that happens. Um, there's other things like tolerance. And very much related to these, what they essentially do is some form of <coughs> um, getting R squareds from models where they might say, let's fit a model to see how well X2 x3 all the way up to our last x variable, xk, how well they can estimate x1. Okay. So if the r squared for this model is very high, 
what that's telling us is all these x variables can essentially predict what x1 is. Right? So that's what we call multicollinearity, where multiple x variables are almost perfectly associated with another variable. Then it fits a model seeing can we predict x2 using x1, x3, and so on, right, using all the other x variables. So can we use all the other variables in the model to predict x2, and so on. So that's the essence of what these uh, measures are doing. They're seeing how well can all the other x variables predict one of the x variables in the model. If they can, that gives an idea of this multicollinearity, where essentially all the info that's contained in this one variable can be captured by all the other x variables. So that's something to read more on uh, on your own if you want to explore this a little bit more. What I want to do is talk about kind of one, um, what I should say, in a separate video in R, we'll look numerically at collinearity, identifying it, seeing how um, the variables and coefficients behave and so on. So we'll look at a a data set example of that in a moment. What I want to do is give you one more, a little bit of a ridiculous example. Okay, it's exaggerated, it's not realistic, but to make the point. So suppose that we were going to try and estimate the mean FEV, right, the length capacity, using age <coughs> and age. Okay. So that's so why I'm saying this is a ridiculous example. Okay, first, in practice, you would never do this, right? You wouldn't put the same variable in a model twice. <clears throat> and in reality, if you tried to, you'd actually get an error. The math would fall apart and you'd, you know, no software will fit a model that has the same variable in there twice. But what I want to do is just kind of a thought experiment, right? thinking through this idea of what things would look like if we did this. So what I'm trying to do is create uh, an artificial example where we have two variables that are very highly associated. Right? So for now I'm saying let's just put the same variable in there twice and, and think of what would happen. Okay. So what can happen is now that we have the same variable in there twice, right, or what we're trying to mimic is the idea of two variables that are so highly associated and contain the same info, we could end up with the coefficient for B1, say, being 5. Again, these numbers won't make sense in terms of FEV. Just focus on the, the concept of what I'm trying to get at. And 5 here. Right? So if the coefficient for age should be 10, these two could be sharing the effect. Right? We have two variables that contain the same info. Their effect gets split between age 1 and age 2. Right? What also could happen is this one could end up being 0 and this one 10 all the weight could kind of randomly end up on one of them. Or we could end up even with an extreme case where, say this one ends up being positive 15, and this one negative 5. Now, what I want you to see is in all these examples I made, the kind of combined age effect is 10, right? 5 and 5, or 10 and 0, or positive 15 and negative 5. So all of these sets of coefficients would end up producing the exact same prediction for the outcome. Again, ridiculous, we're not going to put the same variable in twice and we can't, but hopefully you see what I'm trying to show you here, is that where the weighting ends up can be sort of random. That's part of why we're going to see the standard errors increase a lot, right? Or this variance inflate. Okay? You see, the uncertainty in these coefficients is going to shoot up a lot. Because we're not sure should most of the weighting go here or should most of it go here. Right? It's sort of random where it ends up if these two variables are sharing the same effect or capturing the same info. Like in that example where I said trying to estimate lung capacity using the age of kids and what grade they're in. Right? These variables contain the same info essentially. Okay? And so all the weight could go to age and say the grade's not important. Or we could end up with most of the weight on grade, saying grade's important, age is not. Or they could be sharing the effect. Or we could actually see things like this happen, where we get extremely biased estimates. Some get very overweighted, and some get underweighted. And we'll actually see that in the data set that we look at in PAR, is that um, one of the variables is going to get an extremely biased coefficient. So 
this is the idea of collinearity or multicollinearity. And again, I just want to bring you back to this idea. Concepts are what are the most important. We don't just want to look at what happens numerically when we include or exclude variables, but we want to think conceptually, does it make sense that these two variables are capturing the same info or not? Stick around, guys. There's more to see, and please stay safe.